I'd like to analyze another switch. Uh, uh, uh. In 2004, there was a National Democratic Convention, which is a which is a big, big gathering of the Democratic Party in uh, um, in the U.S. In 2004, Barack Obama is running in Illinois. He's not known. Some people know him in the Democratic Party, but he's not a national figure. And he's going to make a speech that now is considered to be the speech that made Barack Obama president. He's not, he, he did not win the 2004 election. He's not running in 2004. And if you remember, he's going to run later. But he does a speech that is going to put him uh, in a certain position, recognition at a certain level. So I'd like to for us to watch uh, uh, the, um, the beginning of the speech. We're just going to watch the first few minutes. But same question. I'd like to know if you find him convincing, if you can recognize the different strategies, rhetoric strategies, and the effect that it can have. Try to see it as if you didn't know Barack Obama. <laughs> Try to see it as uh, like most people saw Barack Obama that day, which is, oh, here's maybe that guy who we've heard a little uh, uh, about, uh, but no more than uh, no more than that. So let me share the share screen and I'm going to jump just a bit over because people clap a lot at the beginning. The, qui the quality is a bit bad of the video. I apologize in advance, but it's partly because it's an old video from 2004 that moved from being recorded on a VHS to uh, uh, digital and then to YouTube. So the, 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 the quality is bad, but uh, what's important is the speech. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dick Durbin. You make us all proud. On behalf of the great state of Illinois, crossroads of a nation, land of Lincoln, let me express my deepest gratitude for the privilege of addressing this convention. Tonight is a particular honor for me because, let's face it, my presence on this stage is pretty unlikely. My father was a foreign student, born and raised in a small village in Kenya. He grew up herding goats, went to school in a tin roof shack. His father, my grandfather, was a cook, a domestic servant to the British. But my grandfather had larger dreams for his son. Through hard work and perseverance, my father got a scholarship to study in a magical place, America that shone as a beacon of freedom and opportunity to so many who had come before. While studying here, my father met my mother. She was born in a town on the other side of the world, in Kansas. Her father worked on oil rigs and farms through most of the Depression. The day after Pearl Harbor, my grandfather signed up for duty, joined Patton's army, marched across Europe. Back home, my grandmother raised a baby and went to work on a bomber assembly line. After the war, they studied on the GI Bill, bought a house through FHA, and later moved west, all the way to Hawaii, in search of opportunity. And they, too, had big dreams for their daughter a common dream born of two continents. My parents shared not only an improbable love, they shared an abiding faith in the possibilities of this nation. They would give me an African name, Barack, or Blessed, believing that in a tolerant America, your name is no barrier to success. They imagined, they imagined me going to the best schools, in the land, even though they weren't rich, because in a generous America, you don't have to be rich to achieve your potential. They're both passed away now. 
And yet I know that on this night, they do look down on me with great pride. They stand here, and I stand here today, grateful for the diversity of my heritage, aware that my parents' dreams live on in my two precious daughters. I stand here knowing that my story is part of the larger American story, that I owe a debt to all of those who came before me, and that in no other country on earth is my story even possible. Tonight, we gather to affirm the greatness of our nation, not because of the height of our skyscrapers or the power of our military or the size of our economy. Our pride is based on a very simple premise, summed up in a declaration made over 200 years ago. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is the true genius of America. A faith, a faith in simple dreams, an insistence on small miracles, that we can tuck in our children at night and know that they are fed and clothed and safe from harm. That we can say what we think, write what we think, without hearing a sudden knock on the door. That we can have an idea and start our own business without paying a bribe. That we can participate in the political process without fear of retribution, and that our votes will be counted at least most of the time. This year, in this election, we are called to reaffirm our values and our commitments, to hold them against a hard reality, and see how we're measuring up to the legacy of our forebears and the promise of future generations. And fellow Americans, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, I say to you tonight, we have more work to do. More work to do for the workers I met in Galesburg, Illinois who are losing their union jobs at the Maytag plant that's moving to Mexico, and now are having to compete with their own children for jobs that pay seven bucks an hour. More to do for the father that I met who was losing his job and choking back the tears wondering how he would pay $4,500 a month for the drugs his son needs without the health benefits that he counted on. More to do for the young woman in East St. Louis, and thousands more like her who has the grades, has the drive, has the will, but doesn't have the money to go to college. Now, don't get me wrong. The people I meet in small towns and big cities and diners and office parks, they don't expect government to solve all their problems. They know they have to work hard to get ahead, and they want to. Go into the collar counties around Chicago, and people will tell you they don't want their tax money wasted by a welfare agency or by the Pentagon. Go in. Go. So, not about the entire content, uh, uh, but so we've listened to him for seven minutes. Uh, uh, what do you think about the way that he conveys himself, presents himself? Uh, so, he, through yeah. the multiplication of anecdotes, he told us about him without talking about him, and he told us about the country. Uh, 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 of the people uh, in the audience, so their country, without telling them about them, but telling anecdotes, which also shows him to be close to the people. So he built up an image of himself through a lot of anecdotes that were not necessarily about himself. And as you said, he always linked it back to the values of the country. So he talked about the country without talking about the country. So you see that there are things that are emergent without necessarily being in the... Um, in the content. What do you think, uh, Mozami? Yes, exactly. I mean, uh, uh, he must be empathetic uh, leader, I guess, like, you know, because he must have gone through some pain, which he again feels for the, you know, country who is facing, uh, the country people who are facing. So that's how he's like, you know, talking uh, about him as well as about the country. So indirectly, like uh, about him and his life and his family life so that is how he he, he can be a, i mean he, he should be a uh an, an empathetic leader i guess 
So, I mean, he knows the solution and he knows the problem. So that's how, and he wants to solve the, you know, a problem for the country as a whole. Yeah. Because he has gone through the same thing. Yeah. And, and then think about this question. I'll, I'll, I'll let the others talk, but then it, it leads to a question. Why is someone who's just running for local office trying to talk at a national level? Because it's 2004, Barack Obama is not running for president. John Kerry is going to run against W. Bush uh, in the next national election. So if we are being critical and strategic thinker, why is someone so locally involved painting himself at a national level? We'll come back to that question. First, I, I, I want to hear the, 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 the next, uh, but think about that and we'll come back to that. I, I, would, I would even uh, go a bit further and say that he's uh, being a bit manipulative and he's being smart because he's making people, he's telling to people, since I come from, uh, 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 um, my father was yeah. uh, black, he was, he was <laughs> born in Kenya, uh, uh, and still you, my, and still I'm here. So it means that you are good people because he says my presence here is unlikely because <laughs> my father comes from Kenya, because I come from a mixed race background, because uh, I'm seen as being black and yet I'm here. And by saying that, he's telling the people in the audience, you are good people because you let me, me, how great are we because I'm speaking. So he's both at the same time saying that um, yeah. he deserves to be here and it's amazing, but he's making other people feel good because, you know, that means I'm not racist because I cheer for Barack Obama. Uh, I think, Mariam, yeah. Marianne, what do you think uh, about our friend Barack here? Yes, uh, I just wanted to say like the author that I think the strength of the speech is the storytelling that he like he's very good at. And I think that uh, yeah, nowadays, if you want to convince, you need to use uh, storytelling. So it's really based on emotions. And um, also, if I remember well, there is one moment where he's saying, I believe, like, I, I believe, I believe many times. And like, well, it, that's my own opinion, but I think it makes him passionate. So you're thinking of it like, okay, he, he has values and everything. So it, it yeah. makes you really connected, uh, connected to him on an emotional level. Again, as you, as you say, it's through a storytelling. So he's not telling you, here are my values and here are the values of our country. It's through a series of anecdotes and stories that you can relate to. So Adam Newman that we saw before was convincing through uh, this kind of methodical structuring of uh, 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 abstract terms. Here he's telling us, he's just telling us stories. So how could you be against a story? A story is never wrong. You cannot contradict a story. You know, especially if I don't say that story means that. If I'm just telling you a story, and I'm letting you feel and think whatever you want based on that story. But if I'm smart in the art of rhetoric, I will tell you a story that I know is going to make you think of me and uh, 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 what I'm doing in a certain way. So you're, you're very uh, uh, um, relevantly pointing out, it's about storytelling here. It's a lot of stories. It's, it's not abstract. He's, he's a Harvard educated professor in a university and a lawyer. <laughs> he, he, he has no problem with abstraction. But here, eight minutes of stories. What did you think? So yeah, first of all, it's, it's clearly a speech for the Democratic Convention. It's for Americans. So yeah. very quickly, we can feel uh, the Americanness uh, uh, behind it. And so, as, 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 but as we said, rhetoric is about you know, knowing the audience. So you are not and we are not the target here. So we see it differently than if we are in the room chanting in 2004. Um, about it being fake, that, that's a very important thing, is that uh, um, if you want to convey things uh, uh, a certain way, if you start on the wrong foot, you're going to very quickly diverge with your audience. So the same way that Adam Newman only started to say numbers once he established himself as being knowledgeable and, uh, uh, um, and uh, mastering what he's, what he's talking about, then when he starts the number, we don't question him. But if we had a negative uh, opinion of him before, then when he throws the number, we don't see them the same way. Here, it's the same thing. If you don't relate to the stories, that's the danger of storytelling. If you don't like the story, if you don't relate to the stories, then they don't speak to you. And particularly when he says, only in the US is that possible. If you come from a country where you feel that that would be possible as well, 
well, you're going to stay well, Barack, not only the US. But since you're talking to American people, and when you're playing on the, the, the nationalistic prides of some people in the US, it can be very powerful. So again, it's, it's all about your audience. If you had made that speech in front of a European crowd, for example, it wouldn't have been taken the same way. So I absolutely agree with you that you can you know, diverge and, 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 and lose the guy, even if you say that you have a positive opinion about yes, him. Yes, I like you. You can, you can, you can be lost. Uh, so yeah. when, when, what's important with this idea of lifting the veil of rhetoric, it's not just for uh, 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 amusement. It's, it's important if you be strategic, because if you're John Kerry, if you are Hillary Clinton, or if you're anyone in the Democratic Party in the US who are who's thinking that you're going to be running in the next presidential election, when that guy comes on stage, paints himself as an American, tells a national level story. So he's not focused on Illinois. He's not focused on Chicago. He's not focused on things that are directly what he's doing now. He's placing himself in a trajectory that should worry you. So lifting the veil of rhetoric is absolutely necessary for someone who wants to be a strategic thinker, someone who wants to anticipate. It's not just about being critical for the sake of being critical and seeing what's behind it. It's important if you are looking at an entrepreneur and you lift the veil of rhetoric and you find emptiness, then you shouldn't invest. If you're listening to him and you're thinking about joining the company and you're skeptical about uh, the content of his speech and therefore his strategy and his company, then you shouldn't go work there because that could be problematic. And if you're a competitor, if you're an employee, if you're a manager, if you are someone who wants to become CEO or if you're someone who wants to create a company, deconstructing the rhetoric is an extremely powerful and necessary tool. It's not just something to be critical for the sake of being critical. It's analyzing rhetoric <laughs> in order to know how to position yourself and uh, um, to put in place strategies that can be powerful, useful, and successful uh, to a certain extent.